Hello, and welcome back to Argyle Digital CMO Virtual. My name is Brittany Sullivan with Argyle. A couple of notes before I turn things over to our presenters. First, a quick reminder to stop by our sponsor's virtual booth at any time during today's event and for the following week. Sponsor booths are accessible from the main agenda page for this event. To ask questions throughout the session, simply type into the Q&A chat and we will address your questions at the end of the session. Now, I am thrilled to introduce our speakers, Kevin Iredell, Chief Marketing Officer at Lowenstein Sandler, and Mary Considine, Chief Marketing Officer at Ascenda Integrated Health. We are pleased to have Kevin and Mary with us for today's fireside chat titled, Virtual Value, How to Engage Your Audience While Remote. Welcome Kevin and Mary, over to you. Well, hello everybody. Um, I'm Mary Considine. I am the Chief Marketing Officer, uh, Marketing Officer to Senda Integrated Health. Um, in my role, I lead the marketing, internal communications, public relations, and development teams. And I'm really thrilled to be here today. Great. And uh, also welcome everyone. My name is Kevin Iredell. I, uh, again, am the Chief Marketing Officer at Lowenstein Sandler. Uh, much like Mary, my responsibilities include business development, marketing communications, public relations, uh, marketing technology, uh, and a whole bunch of other things I'm sure I'm forgetting. So uh, it's really, it's great to be here. And uh, hopefully this is going to be a engaging uh, fireside chat. I tried to light a small fire here in the office to, for some ambiance, but apparently that's frowned upon in the office. Uh, but so we're going to talk for, for about a half an hour and we're going to take questions. So if you put the questions in the chat, Brittany is on the background uh, monitoring those. Uh, and that would be great uh, for us at the end. But we're going to kick things off uh, with a few, a few back and forth questions. I'm going to start uh, by asking Mary. The pandemic uh, has forced organizations into digital first uh, and working remote, you know, has become the new norm for most people. How has your organization navigated this transition and, and the impact on your customers? Absolutely. Well, certainly I want to start with, we've always wanted to be digital first. I think we've always thought that we were digital first, uh, but certainly the pandemic has led us to know that that actually was not the case. Um, but we did get a huge education, I think all of us, and were able to really set the wheels in motion to get there. Um, I'm in healthcare, so certainly the most important thing for us um, was telehealth, telemedicine. Um, you know, that it's not new, not something that, you know, it's been around for quite a while. Um, but the perception of it, certainly on the consumer side, was that maybe it wasn't quite as good. Um, it wasn't something I really wanted to try. Um, and of course, with the pandemic, that was really a platform that we would be utilizing moving forward. Um, I'm largely in the behavioral healthcare realm, which is traditionally face-to-face um, -face, um, appointments. Um, we also offer residential programming and things like that that continued in person. But really the bread and butter of what we do um, was you know, face to face in person and really kind of moving to digital first and essentially for many of our services, digital only um, was huge for us. Um, luckily we had the telehealth telemedicine platforms. So really for us from the marketing end, it was just a huge education to the consumer base um, and our internal stakeholders on really why, you know, telemedicine was the way to go rather than just not uh, seeing your therapist or not participating in your, your traditional health services. Um, this was actually a way that you would be able to do that and stay safe. When March hit a year ago, I mean, we had to cancel, we stopped all of our campaigns. Everything was all of a sudden irrelevant. Um, imagery, messaging, and I'm sure you have the same thing. It just, there were no masks. We were, you know, talking a completely different world that no longer existed. Um, so, you know, again, I think the education was key um, for us. And, you know, in the end, we really ended up having a huge expansion of our content um, really kind of coming through the pandemic. So, you know, that's certainly been one silver lining for us. Um, but definitely as far as digital first, um, moving to telemedicine and then educating our consumer base on why that's an important move. It, did it change how your clients find you in the first place? 
Yes. So it's interesting because, you know, traditionally, um, you know, a lot of our services were referral based and they might have been through a, you know, a doctor's office or, or, you know, sometimes it's, it could be law enforcement, could be a teacher, some, you know, it really wasn't largely, um, you know, through online means. Well, you know, we really changed, um, and these were the traditional face-to-face -face programs. We did a lot in Google ads and things for other services, but these particular ones, that really wasn't how we were found. That certainly changed. Um, and, you know, with the way that we do things, we have acquired a lot of new customers through that um, because we were able to quickly pivot and make sure that we were there um, when people were searching for us. So, yeah, absolutely. How about you? I mean, how has... Uh, you know, this happened for you guys, and how were you able to to go digital first? Yeah, so so similar to you, you know, we we had always well, not always, but we consider ourselves digital first, right? But much like uh, your clients, you know, we're a law firm, so uh, I would say that the prevailing wisdom is that most of our business comes from referrals. And, you know, it's one lawyer or one general counsel at a corporation that says, you know, I know somebody who helped me with this and, you know, you should check them out. Where digital comes in is in what we like to call credentialing. So you get the name of a referral, but the next step is, is not calling them and asking them if they can handle this matter. It's going online and, you know, making sure that their credentials line up to the experience that you're looking for, whether it's their, their biography or articles they've written, conferences they've spoken at, you know, decisions and matters that, that, that match up to their experience. So, you know, I think throughout the, the pandemic, the referrals certainly continued, but more and more people, you know, they didn't have anywhere else to go. So they, they went online and we saw all of the initiatives that, that we had been doing, uh, we saw increased traffic. So across the board to our website, to our podcast, to our webinars and et cetera. So, um, so we, were, we were fortunate that we were thinking digital first and that uh, it wasn't as much of a pivot for us as it was you know, for our clients to just you know, finally come along to <laughs> what we had hoped they would do in the first place. Absolutely. Well, I have a question for you. Um, how are your, you and your teams creating virtual value and engaging customers right now? Yeah, so um, again, because we're, we're business to business professional services, the face-to-face -face networking uh, and business development efforts were paramount prior to the pandemic. You know, that's, that's how business gets done, you know, whether it's at a conference or out on the golf course to use the cliche, you know, it's, that's, uh, that was how, you know, people landed business. Um, it was also some of the value add, right? So it's, so, you know, it could be an existing client. We're not looking for business. We're just looking to, you know, continue that, uh, that relationship. And so there would be, you know, tickets to a show or tickets to a ball game or something just to further the relationship. And, and that's a, you know, a value add to doing business, right? During virtual, couldn't do any of that. So we had to get really creative. And, you know, I, I would say a couple things. My background or a piece of my background is in publishing. So you've heard the cliche content is king. And that's even more true when the only place people can go to find out information is online today. So we decided to produce a lot more content and a lot more targeted content. And there was a lot more things to talk about between the CARES Act and the Paycheck Protection Program and the eviction notice uh, under the CARES Act. We had a lot of content to talk about. So we published a lot more content. But at the same time, that value piece, we actually sent out less emails during the pandemic than we had in the same time the prior year. And we did that on purpose because we knew that every other 
business, forget about every other competing law firm, but every other business in the world was going to be sending out a million emails because that's the first thing and the easiest thing and the cheapest thing that you can do to, to market yourself. So we made a conscious decision that we were going to try to chunk a lot of the content that we were producing that was relevant to a specific audience and send out a very targeted, whether it was a newsletter or alert or something that we knew would be of interest to them. And the rest of the stuff that we were producing, we would put on social media, we would put on LinkedIn, we would put on our website and, you know, uh, optimize for search engine optimization. But, you know, we would save those key messages and key pieces of content to the, cl to the clients that we knew that cared. So from a, from a value add perspective, lessening some of the noise was one of our first uh, initiatives. And then going back to that human interaction, um, we, we came up with a bunch of, uh, bunch of different, you know, kind of unique, um, kind of unique ideas on, you know, everybody did virtual happy hours right away, right? But uh, we did some of those. We did some uh, other virtual events. We sent different, uh, different little gifts to just kind of stay top of mind. Um, and so, you know, I think the, the combination of those things um, kind of, you know, really helped. And we'll talk, we'll talk more about some of the other things later, but, but you know, I want to give you, give you a chance to answer your own question. No, I think it's interesting, um, you know, certainly when you talk about the email, um, I think we all didn't realize how brands that we hardly ever engaged with, um, how much they cared about us during the pandemic. Email was certainly the easy way to go. Um, I think it's interesting that we also did something similar where we segmented our people even more than we did um, pre-pandemic. So we really wanted to send people only information that was going to be something that was useful for them. So we also did something very similar um, because if the same thing, we just didn't want to bother people. It was, you know, a really hard time. And I think as marketers, it's important to acknowledge um, that reality. Um, you know, we certainly all had a job to do and we still have a job to do, but, um, you know, we needed to really be very consumer focused. And, and so that was one of the, the things that we did as well. Um, you know, we definitely struggled, you know, certainly in our industry and what we do, we couldn't do um, virtual happy hours and things like that. Certainly on a professional side, I did, um, but it was tough um, to have some of that virtual engagement we did some webinars, town, town hall style events and things where we were able to do some virtual engagement. Um, but I think, you know, we are kind of missing, um, you know, that kind of in-person connection. Um, mm -hmm. and, you know, we, we've invested in some different platforms to do some different types of virtual things. So I think it's, we've done some unique things, but, um, you know, it, it, that continues to be a struggle to make sure that there is real virtual value there. Um, and I think that if we keep that top of mind, we'll continue to do well. Um, I think it's those, um, you know, those teams that have forgotten that and have kind of taken this for granted. And just now we're, we're just Zooming or we're just, you know, we're just doing this. I think that's really where the challenge is. I think knowing that we have to continue to get better in this area and create new value and, and stand out is really important. Yeah, so, so, so you mentioned, um, you know, the, the, the folks in marketing that just kind of fall back on, well, it's easy to send an email, so let's just blast out a ton of emails. So thinking about your team specifically and in particular, were were they able to, to pivot quickly to focus on this kind of virtual world, virtual customers? And, you know, what else did you do to help kind of strengthen your brand at the same time? Yeah, I think so. I think, you know, I was really proud of how, you know, the team pivoted. I think, you know, I have a, a very, you know, a very different type of team, you know, people from, we're multi-generational, we're just, we're really, it's a great team. It, it really is a very unique team. And I think where some had an easier time, you know, others really needed the structure and wanted that in-person office part. So um, I think as we were going through this, just making sure the individual team got what they needed um, while we were on such a huge pivot. Um, and I, I was really impressed by some of the work, particularly from some of the team members that seemed to have more challenges. Um, 
as you mentioned earlier, content is key. And for us, um, you know, our content had always focused, you know, a lot on our services and, and why our services were, were great and what sets our services apart from the rest. And really, um, you know, moving through the pandemic, the focus of our content was more how our services can help, why our services can be important to you. Not necessarily that we offer the best services, which I believe we certainly do, um, but the content focused more on really what it would mean to be a part of our services and how really we are there to support and help. And that was a different way of writing, a different way of organizing our campaigns. And it you know, really required um, some quick thinking. And, um, and a lot of our, my, you know, less experienced team members were really the ones that were kind of tasked with that. Um, and to see the creativity there um, was, was truly phenomenal. Um, so, you know, I definitely was excited about that. Another thing that was really important to us is we were doing all of this external education, you know, providing content to help educate, not even just about our services, but certainly um, impacts of the pandemic on mental health and, you know, when it's important to seek health, um, providing tips and, and information. Um, but we also wanted to do that for our internal teams. So, um, you know, like you, we have multiple locations. We have 56 locations. So we're used to kind of having some level of remote anyway, when we're working um, with our internal teams. But, you know, we wanted to provide the same type of self-care content to them. So that was also a new thing. Uh, traditionally, our intranet was all about information and trainings and, you know, kudos and promotions and things like that. Um, and really moving to a lot of self-care um, content and information um, that was going to help them um, as individuals certainly uh, thrive through the pandemic and work from home. Um, so that was also new and something that um, we're gonna continue um, moving forward. We really, um, we're proud of the value that we were able to add. And when we look at our analytics on our intranet, um, those are our most read, um, the most read content on there, um, even more so than, you know, downloading information and, and paperwork and things like that. So um, I think that was uh, knowing that we were able to meet that need, even though we didn't realize prior to the pandemic that that need was there um, was certainly important. Mm -hmm. um, how about mm -hmm. your team? How was the pivot over there? Yeah, so, you know, working in the in a legal services and at a law firm, it, law firms are typically more conservative than a lot of businesses. So there there is a thought that, you know, you kind of have to be in the office in order to do your job. Um, you know, the, the, the secret, though, is that, you know, we travel all the time prior to COVID. So as a marketing team and business development team, we were used to being on the road and logging in on our laptop from an airplane or a hotel room or the floor of a conference. So for us, the, you know, the pivot to being virtual was seamless. I mean, we were, we were all ready. Um, that didn't stop a lot of the, the partners or, uh, you know, the executive committee from commenting, wow, you guys really transitioned well. And, and us taking the credit, yes, yes, we did. Yes, this was very difficult, but but we did it. So uh, so the so the, the pivot was easy. The harder part, uh, to be honest, you know, I think was on was on my end, where we would have an internal meeting, and you know, at first, everybody's on the screen, and you know, my assumption is everybody's at home working. And during a team meeting, you know, uh, an animal, a cat or a dog or something crawls past and you're like, huh, well, that's amusing. And then, then there's a child. And I'm like, okay, this is, well, this is different for me. I don't know that I'm okay with this. But, uh, you know, very quickly, it, it, was, it was apparent that the ways of working in the past are over. You know, we all need to adapt. And to your point about some of that self-help, you know, we we uh, published and and republished a lot of articles and uh, self-help materials, and it, it might have even been some of yours about you know uh, adjusting and adapting and giving people you know a little bit of slack on you know what might not be appropriate within an office is completely appropriate on a Zoom call 
internally, you know, where somebody has children at home whose schools are closed and can't have childcare and get over it. If everybody's getting their job done, you know, who cares if they're on the Zoom call with you, right? As long as there's not clients and all those kind of things. So, um, so once I got over that, the, the pivot was seamless. I think, you know, again, my, my team didn't have any problem with it. Um, so, which was, which was really good. So I think it's also beneficial. Now we know what everyone's children and their dogs, cats, fish, whatever look like. So I think we've gotten to know each other as people a little bit better. Um, you know, people I didn't even imagine had like these cute little dogs, like somebody who just didn't, you know, come across like that and, and kind of seeing this little dog on their lap during a meeting really does change perceptions and does give you a little bit more insight to the person. So I really, I really enjoyed that. It definitely, definitely does. And uh, we had shared an article, I think it was in the New York Times, about how that kind of personal, those personal touches, whether it's the child or the dog or the background, um, you know, really helps connect the other people on the call and and the team. And so it became a it became a team building, you know, element to some of our calls. So um, so that was that was a, that that was a learning for me. So I was actually pretty glad that 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 had happened and that I experienced that. Um, I have a question for you. Yeah, I, I lost my place. So, so have at. <laughs> so, what creative measures have you used um, to reach out to new customers, and have you used any new technologies, um, you know, during the pandemic? So, right. So, I talked about, um, you know, really focusing and segmenting some of our lists uh, and, and who we're targeting with what content. And I would say that's probably the, the biggest, uh, not the biggest change, but the, the biggest focus of our efforts. Um, some of the new technology, you know, our, our CRM system is pretty robust to begin with, but the, the service providers uh, that can append third-party data to our CRM information, uh, some of the data visualization providers that can come in and help us draw insights out of, you know, our customer data and our prospect data. Um, you know, we were able to focus on that a little bit, a little bit more, I should say. Um, and, you know, just the, just the exposure that more people going online and, and searching for the articles that we've written or topics that we've written about um, has has drawn a, a, a whole a whole new set of, of clients, you know, still to our core practice, but just a just a broader broader audience. So you know, I wish there was, you know, I wish there was some you know silver bullet or, or magic magic uh, technology that I could really point to, but it was really um, almost going back to basics, you know, good segmenting. Um, uh, a B testing on some of the uh, some of the alerts and and uh, and email newsletters that we were sending out, and you know, just do, being able to analyze it and doing more of what was working. So, so what about you and your technology and finding new clients? Absolutely, I think that um, you know we have not really harnessed any new technologies. Our CRM very robust. We had um, you know made a transition several couple of years ago, so luckily, so we were pretty much good on that end. Um, you know, I think you know it's it's kind of the same. It's utilizing content and um, you know being more creative um, and in in both the content itself and certainly the distribution. Um, and I think that has made a huge difference for us. Um, and that's definitely something that we're going to stick to, um, you know, moving forward. I think, you know, as we're kind of talking, you think about all of the changes that we've made and, you know, I keep checking off boxes that, you know, well, these aren't, these are permanent changes. Um, you know, there's not much temporary um, for us that's really come out of this. So a lot of the creative measures used will be ones that we will continue utilizing, um, you know, moving forward. So, you know, certainly, you know, it was definitely a time for a little bit of creative innovation um, and we were able to, um, you know, do some new things that maybe we wouldn't have done before. So. Yeah. Yeah. I would say, so, so 
also on uh, on top of that, some of the some of the creative ways that we connected with clients, and whether it was you know new or or, or existing clients, um, I mentioned the virtual happy hours, right? And once you've been on one, you know they kind of get a little. They can be awkward, right? If you don't have a good moderator or you don't, right? So we moved to you know a more experiential uh virtual experience where uh we did everything from uh, a museum uh, scavenger hunt where we had a curator from a museum virtually walk us through the exhibits teams had to find different things within the exhibits and then you know they got points and uh, it was a little bit of a competition we had uh we had uh we hired part of the cast from hamilton to do, yeah, they did a they did a song, and then they answered some questions, and they did another song, and it was uh, really fantastic. And we did things like you know, uh, pizza night, make your own pizza night. So we shipped all the ingredients to a select group of clients. They logged in. We had a celebrity chef teach us how to make pizza with the ingredients, and uh, you know, so so there were there were definitely some some very fun um, and creative creative ways to connect. And to your point about checking the box, whether this is temporary or, or whether this is permanent, uh, we had clients that and potential clients that would never come to a baseball game, never play golf, didn't like to go to big cocktail hours or parties because of so you know, they're just more introverted and they didn't want to do it. They loved these things. They could do them from their home. They could log off when they you know, got tired and whatever. And so we had a lot of, lot of, a um, lot of comments that this was great. I hope you keep doing it. I, I want to do this again next year, pandemic or not. So that kind of tells us, you know, these things are, you know, hopefully not as prevalent as they are today, but it's another tool in our toolbox for sure. And, um, you know, the, the, the other thing that helped set us apart from the competition was that, we did a lot of these things first, or at least I, I'd like to think that we they weren't our ideas. People came to us and said, would you like to do this? And we jumped on them. What we heard from clients after they got another invitation from another law firm was, hey, look, they're copying you, which is, you know, the uh, uh, the highest form of flattery, right? It's, uh, yeah. So, um, so yeah, so it set us apart from competition. Um, and and I think some of these things are are here to stay. So, um, what were so we'll move on to the next question. What were the biggest obstacles that you had to overcome, and you know how did you ensure that your services were easy to use in a digital environment? I mean, for us, you know, we take a good Wi-Fi connection for granted. Um, some of us do. Um, and, you know, that was both internal and external. Um, you know, I actually had a team member that really didn't have a very strong Wi-Fi connection. You know, our IT support um, was able to, to assist her. But certainly that was not something that I had really thought about. Um, and, and even from a personal standpoint, my husband... Um, he was doing telemedicine for his practice at our house sometimes. So we were, you know, it was the two of us and my daughter in school, and we had never been utilizing our Wi-Fi connection like that before. So, you know, certainly, you know, there were times where I would be in a meeting and, you know, I'd be kind of in and out or I'd have to cancel and reschedule. So it was kind of, you know, under having a little bit more understanding, a lot of what you said too, you know, when you first saw the kids or the, the dog and, and really, being like, well, no, this is during work hours. We actually have to, to do things differently. Um, so definitely the level of understanding um, from the internal standpoint, but really the external. I mean, in some cases we were helping people get phones and things so that they could utilize our services if they didn't have access to Wi-Fi or um, you know, didn't wanna use their data um, you know, for their services, but they really needed them. So um, that was certainly something we did um, another thing was, um, you know, in the traditional um, behavioral health, you make an appointment to see someone. And, and sometimes you may have to wait weeks for that appointment. Sometimes it may be one week. Um, but we knew that during this pandemic, there were times that people needed immediate help and support. Um, so we were able to launch a completely new method of um, behavioral health delivery by having an on-demand service, where if somebody was needing 
immediate support, um, whether it was a parenting issue or relationship issue, depression, they could go on and schedule an appointment on demand. Um, sometimes there was somebody available immediately, but sometimes it might be in a couple of hours or perhaps the next day, but they were able to lock in that appointment online. They didn't have to call anybody or, or do anything. They could do all of it online. And they also got access to immediate um, resources. So we put out a whole bunch of videos on different situations and how people are able to you know, help at home. So if you are having an issue with your child and they're doing homework, they're not wanting to do their homework or engage in online learning, um, we had tools that you could use immediately, um, even without seeing somebody um, that would be able to help help and support. So it was really looking at what those obstacles were. It was certainly you know, the, the having the means to, to utilize our telemedicine platforms, um, but then it was also, you know, was our traditional service delivery really what people wanted? Was the calling or going online, making an appointment that you weren't going to get right away, um, was that a real obstacle to get people the help and support that they needed? And then we definitely felt yes. Um, so we were able to certainly innovate there and kind of, you know, break down that barrier so people could get um, immediate access um, to help and support. So that was definitely, um, you know, taking some time and, and, you know, looking at, you know, what was in people's way. Um, how about you? Well, it's, I can definitely relate to the Wi-Fi issue. Uh, I had no idea that we had so many devices that would draw on Wi-Fi. I was at home working, my wife was at home working, and my daughter was at school. And I'm looking at the Wi-Fi network and I'm like, we have 16 devices on Wi-Fi. And I'm like, who is on our Wi-Fi network? And, I, you know, I, I have my laptop, I have my phone, I have a desktop that's running. Uh, my, my, there's an Apple Watch somewhere. There's, a, there's, a, there's an iPad. You know, my daughter's watching class and TikTok and Netflix all at the same time. And so... Yes, that was good. that was quite an obstacle. But once we once we figured that out, uh, I think the other obstacle was was more um, more psychological. And I think a lot of people went through this was the feeling in the beginning that you know everything we were in an emergency situation, and everything that was coming at us, we were reacting to as as it was an emergency the cares act was passed and we had to let all of our clients know and we had to publish this content and of course the cares act doesn't pass at 11 a.m on a monday it passes at 8 p.m on a friday night when you know the congress wants to get out of there so they pass and walk away and so a lot of the struggle for us was there was no separation between the office and home because Everybody was at home. So it was easy to kind of get sucked in there. At the same time, there was no compartmentalizing if your child is sick. You know, it, it, it sounds, sounds a little cold, but, you know, before COVID, your child was sick and you, somebody came to take care of them or you dropped them to take care. He came to the office and for a little bit, you could focus on work and maybe not think so much. But if you're at home and your child is sick, I don't care what work is coming in, your child comes first. So getting through all of that and, and the stress that comes with just that constant barrage of, you know, emergency um, feeling, that was, that was a lot to get over. But, uh, you know, once I think once we got past the first couple of months, I think everybody, everybody was doing a lot better with it. Certainly once the weather changed here in the Northeast and the sun came out and it stopped being as cold and snowy as it was, there's a much greater sense of hope. So. Absolutely. Well, I know we wanna make sure we leave time for questions, but I have one more question for you. Um, so does the distribution of the vaccine change any of your plans? Um, do you continue to focus on, di on virtual engagement? Um, what, what are your plans? How does the vaccine come into play for you? I th so two answers. One, yes, we continue to focus on virtual. I think that a lot of what we have done, digital first, virtual component, and the virtual option for meetings and networking and 
team, uh, et cetera. I think that continues. Um, I also think, you know, we don't want to turn our back on it. God forbid we need to do this again in the fall with the flu or, or whatever, whatever reason. Um, but two, I think, I think the vaccine is a game changer. I mean, that's not news, right? But I think more importantly, businesses need to decide what their return to work is going to look like. Because I don't think that you can make a wrong decision right now, except not making a decision. So I've heard some companies say, we're going to play it by ear. We're going to see how it goes. That, personally, I feel that that mentally is, uh, that's a not good for the people that are part of the company. I think some people are looking for structure. Some people want to continue to work from home, you know, but, but nobody likes that uncertainty. So whether you decide we're coming back July 30th or we're coming back January 1st, or we're not coming back at all. And we're going to just be virtual from now on. I think making that decision and planning for that, that's the way to go. So Personally, I think that, you know, we're more of an in-person, again, I mentioned we're a conservative kind of business. I think that uh, we have made the decision that at some point, most of us will be back in the office. Um, and that's what we're planning for. Again, things could change, but our plan is we bring back the people who can come back, who get the vaccine and can safely work in the, in the office. And for those that don't, that'll be their plan that, that they don't come back. So. Uh, but I, but again, I think it's I think it's important to make a decision and stick to the plan. So, what are you guys going to do? I think you know we're very similar. Certainly, you know, different parts of my organization, um, you know, have have transitioned back. Um, you know, just with early access to vaccinations for healthcare professionals and things like that. Um, but you know, some a lot of the administrative staff and my team, you know, in particular, um, you know, we won't be a moving forward all remote team, um, you know, there's just a lot of collaboration that we're really used to that hasn't translated as well um, virtually. Uh, it, it certainly is there, but not, you know, I mean that, you know, nothing like sitting in an office with a whiteboard doing ideas and, and kind of sharing in that way. Um, so I do look forward to being able to go back to that, although we know that will be a little while. Um, but in order to do that, you know, we a month in advance of when people are going to start coming back for two days, um, you know, we've kind of put that already in place um, moving forward. And I do think you're right. I think there's so much unknown. Um, I think at this time last year, we all thought we'd be back in the office in two weeks. And, you know, that certainly didn't pan out. And we haven't really known, um, you know, when that would be. And, and the vaccine is a game changer. And, you know, it will allow us to be able to have some return to normalcy. When that is, we're not sure yet, um, but certainly I think making sure that we're very transparent as leaders um, as to what that means for our teams is, is super important. So absolutely, I could not agree more. I, I will admit that there's a piece of me that uh, would prefer our return to office happen after Labor Day, but... <laughs> <laughs> but I think our plan is a little sooner than that. So yeah. we'll, we'll, we'll see what happens. <laughs> so I know uh, we got the word from Brittany and we have about 10 minutes and we want to go to Q and A. So if Brittany can unmute and jump in here. Yeah, thank you both so much for such an insightful discussion. Um, as a reminder to the audience, you can still enter questions. Uh, so we'll go ahead and review a couple that came through. The first question, is there a Goldilocks balance for customer outreach that you've found? Uh, so I, I guess the short answer is no. The longer answer is, you know, testing is key. So you got to find out what works for what segment. Uh, what, when I said we were doing less emails, we test it, you know, let's send a couple more this week or let's change up the messaging and, and see what happens. One of our email newsletters to, to a substantial list uh, at one point had a 70% open rate. And when it first came back, I was like, well, there, there's a problem. There's a mistake. This can't be right. 
And it was it was that segmenting that we got right. And we never would have gotten there had we not, you know, tested, tested the segmentation and tested the content and, to, and tested to make sure that uh, that was resonating. And we were able to replicate that for that particular group. Um, other groups, you know, we're still, we're still averaging really good open rates, but obviously, you know, not as high as 70%, but, uh, you know, I, I think, it all goes to giving the the right content at the right time in the in the in the right cadence and the only way you can get there is just by constantly testing and adjusting yeah i agree with kevin completely i mean i think it's been the same for us um, where in some areas we found early success and in others we you know continue to kind of search and figure out um you know kind of what we need to do to break through um you know i think that we i'm not sure why we didn't test things as much prior to the pandemic as we do now um and i think that was obviously the need and necessity to do that but it, you know as i mentioned earlier things that we're going to keep you know, more testing is certainly, you know, one of those things we are going to keep because that certainly was such a core part of how we moved throw forward through the pandemic. And, um, you know, we all learn that, but then we kind of forget just how much is really necessary. Um, so I do think another silver lining, um, you know, if, if there are some, is certainly that we kind of went back to basics and really tested a lot of things to see what worked and what didn't work. So we weren't trying to deliver content that people didn't want because we wanted them to hear it. Um, we really were working hard to deliver the content that they wanted um, to consume. Great, thank you both. Our next question, uh, from your experience, what were the biggest challenges in pivoting to a digital first environment? Right. Go ahead, Mary. I, I started the last question. If you want to jump in. No, I mean, I think, you know, it's it kind of a lot of what we said earlier is, is really we thought we were digital first. So we were, you know, kind of, well, we've got this. And, um, you know, certainly um, in the, the early days, really kind of coming to the understanding that we don't have this and we really need to figure out how to be uh, digital first. So, you know, I think it was the, the biggest challenge um, at the front end was really just taking understanding that we don't have it. We really need to, to educate ourselves and to figure out what our audience wants. This is completely new. This is completely different. And as great as we thought we were in the digital realm, we were really not there. Um, so for us, that was certainly the, the biggest obstacle to our pivot. And once we broke through that, um, you know, there certainly was, it was easier, um, you know, continues to be a challenge, but it was definitely easier um, for us. Yeah, same for us. I would say some of the, some of the perception that uh, social media doesn't, my clients aren't on social media or my clients are never gonna to go to a virtual happy hour. Uh, you know, there, was, there was a little bit of hesitancy to try new things, uh, but this gave us the opportunity to say, there is no other option. <laughs> you can't take them out to lunch. There are no golf courses that are open. The Yankees are not playing right now in front of a live audience. So let's try this. So the, 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 that was, uh, that perception change that multiple avenues, multiple initiatives can all work together. Uh, that was that was key for us. And we've said it before, those things are here to stick. The folks that I never in a million years would have imagined on a podcast are experts at podcasting now. And they know, did you, did you sign up for SoundCloud, Kevin? I'm like, I, yes, I did. <laughs> We're all set. <laughs> it's not just about Spotify anymore. I'm like, so. All right, thank you. It looks like we have time for one, one more question. Uh, what recommendations can you make for engaging your audience while remote? And in, and in what way is this better, better or worse than traditional marketing efforts? Let me take the last part of the question first. I would argue that these are traditional marketing efforts now. Maybe a year ago, we could have had that, that, that argument, but, uh, but today, this is, this is our life, this is reality. 
Um, so, you know, I think it's all about getting there first before your competition, because the sooner that you can get your message out on, on a new platform, uh, the more people are going to hear it and the more you're going to own that, that platform. So, uh, you know, I think these things and more, more to come are here to stay. And so we just, as marketers, we need to just keep educating ourselves and, 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 and innovating like that. Yeah, I would agree with you. I think my advice and recommendation would be to keep learning, um, keep discovering what's out there and use this as an opportunity to, to innovate. Um, it's certainly, um, you know, the way to be top of mind and to be doing it the best and better than anybody else. Wonderful. Well, thank you both so much again for such an insightful fireside chat. And thank you everyone who joined us for this fantastic closing session. This session, along with all of today's content, will be available on demand following the event. We would like to thank today's sponsor, Concentric, once again for their support and for making Argyle Digital CMO Virtual a success. Also, just a reminder to please take a moment to submit your feedback in our survey as we take your feedback very seriously. So thank you again for joining us today and engaging in our content. We look forward to seeing you at the next, or tomorrow for day two of CMO Virtual. Thank you guys so much again. Thank you. Thank you.